You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Good morning. I'm Chrissy de Klerk Salagi. And I'm Jason Salagi with today's Caffeinated History with the Salagis on the BQN Podcast Collective. Today's topic is the events of the day of 9 11. Because our episode happened to drop on the anniversary, we felt it important to discuss its history. But as we worked to put together the why and the how of these events, we realized that despite our feeling that this is only recent memory, we have listeners who were not aware of the events at the time or maybe hadn't even yet been born. And so we decided to review the essentials of that day. In the weeks to come, we'll have episodes discussing both what led to these attacks and the subsequent responses. At 8.46 a.m. on the 11th of September in 2001, in the moment that American Airlines Flight 11 hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center, few, if anyone, thought it was an act of terrorism. It looked like an accident. A terrible accident, to be sure, but one for which the Trade Center's architects had actually planned. First responders moved quickly to the site, knowing that they had a difficult job ahead, and it was likely that many people had already been killed. But they knew that the building was designed to stay standing, at least long enough to evacuate it. However, the scenario the designers had in mind was something akin to a tired pilot losing their way in the fog at the end of a long flight. They did not imagine planes with full fuel tanks being used as bombs. The buildings were reinforced against fire, of course, but the kind of fire that might break out in an office building. Such a fire wouldn't produce temperatures hot enough to weaken steel, but burning jet fuel can do just that. The steel holding up the structure, particularly one as large as the Trade Center, does not need to melt to weaken enough to cause it to collapse. Any idea that it was an accident disappeared less than 20 minutes later, when United Airlines Flight 175 hit the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. It was obvious now that this was a planned attack. Two more planes had been hijacked that morning, American Airlines Flight 77 and United Airlines Flight 93. The former crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. The latter was directed at either the White House or the Capitol, but the hijackers were overtaken by the passengers and crew, and the plane was crashed into a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, at two minutes after 10 a.m. Just a few minutes earlier, the South Tower had collapsed. Though it had been hit second, that plane was going much faster and did more immediate structural damage. The North Tower collapsed a half hour later taking with it the Marriott Hotel that sat between the two. These collapses sprayed burning debris across the nearby area, causing damage and fires in several buildings. One of these was Tower 7 of the World Trade Center complex. Shortly after it had been evacuated, along with the rest of the buildings near the towers, a fire had been observed. But knowing that it had been fully evacuated, first responders prioritized finding survivors in the collapse site over putting out that fire. It was allowed to burn unattended for over seven hours, resulting in its collapse at 5.20 that evening. Tower 7 was one of five other buildings in the Trade Center complex that were destroyed due to damage caused by the collapse of the North and South Towers. Three other nearby buildings were also destroyed due to the collapse, and most of the buildings for blocks around required at least some level of renovation or reconstruction before they could be occupied again. The part of the Pentagon where the plane hit collapsed at 10.50 a.m. In the meantime, the airspace of the United States was completely shut down. All commercial aircraft were ordered to land at the nearest airport at 9.45 a.m., The Canadian government also grounded all flights safe for military and emergency personnel. That grounding, of course, did not include Air Force One, which carried President George W. Bush as he returned from an event in Florida. At 10.20 a.m., the president gave permission to assume that any unauthorized planes still in the air were hostile and should be shot down. A Korean air flight over Alaska was almost shot down shortly after this due to communication and translation problems that led air traffic control to believe that it also had been hijacked. By the time President Bush addressed the nation from the Oval Office at 8.30 that evening, the CIA had already determined the attack was likely the work of al-Qaeda, a terrorist group under the leadership of Osama bin Laden, who had also been involved in other attacks against American targets, including the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He did not discuss this in the address, of course, but the information was passed to the news media shortly thereafter. Within a day, the members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, had invoked Article 5 of its charter, the Mutual Defense Clause. Member nations later joined the U.S. in its retaliatory invasion of Afghanistan. 
This is the only time Article 5 has been invoked. With the exception of the collapse of Tower 7, the immediate destruction was over just two hours after it began. However, for the friends and family of the nearly 3,000 people killed that day, and those of the thousands of soldiers sent to Afghanistan and Iraq in its wake, the horror can never be over. Thank you for listening. We'd also like to thank our History with the Zalagis Patreon patrons, Patty, Susan Capuzzi de Clerc, Laura Dell, Chris Hill, Betty Larson, and Vince Locke. Their contributions help us to have the time to research and write what you're hearing. You can help us just like they do with a monthly subscription at patreon.com slash history with the Zalagis. Also, thank you to Mark White for the show art and Zach Tripp for the closing music. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast player and don't forget to rate and review us there as well. And while you're at it, check out the rest of the great shows and the BQN Collective. We'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to reach out, you can find our network on the socials at BQN Podcasts and this podcast in particular at History Zalagi. You can also talk about any and all of the BQN Podcasts in our Facebook group, the BQN Collective. And last but not least, you can find me on the socials at The Goddess Livia. That's T-H-E-G-O-D-D-E-S-S-L-I-V-I-A. And me at Jason Dark Elf. We'd love to hear topic suggestions. What would you like to learn on caffeinated history? 